Okay, so if you don't mind, let's begin. So again, hello everyone. Thank you for joining another Epicenter seminar, the online editions. Today we are honored to have Dr. Gemma Kremen, uh, who is going to talk about a decision-making methodology for, research, uh, for risk-informed earthquake early warning. Uh, I'll give a short uh, introduction to Gemma. Uh, Dr. Gemma Kremen is a research fellow at University College London and Epicenter Research Group. Uh, she specializes uh, in developing statistical tools to support decision-making related to seismic activities as well as other natural hazards. Uh, she's currently working to uh, quantify, model, and communicate disaster risk within the Tomorrow Cities Hub, and also is contributing to the development of next-generation earthquake early warning systems within the TERN Key project. Prior to joining UCL, Gemma worked at University of Bristol, and uh, she completed her PhD in earthquake engineering at Stanford University. So Gemma, thank you very much for joining us today. And Thanks. the floor is all yours. Hey, thank you, Arash. Um, okay, I'll just share my screen. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, I think that should be the right way around. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Okay. Let's give it some time. Select the right screen. Um, uh huh. Something is coming up. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, should be the right way around now. Yep, perfect. Okay. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much. Right. Thank you, Arash, uh, for the, the introduction and uh, welcome to my presentation. So I'm going to be talking about a decision-making methodology for risk-informed earthquake early warning. Now, um, let's start off, first of all, by talking about exactly what earthquake early warning is. So we can broadly define earthquake early warning as a set of tools um, and procedures for processing and disseminating information about ongoing earthquakes in real time. So on the left of the screen here, we see an earthquake that's occurring. Now from seismology, we know that the earthquake will first release um, P waves. And in an earthquake early warning system, these P waves will be uh, picked up by a seismic network located close to an earthquake, um, if we're talking about a regional earthquake early warning system. And based on the information uh, incorporated in the P waves, we can determine an estimate of the location of the earthquake, for example, its magnitude, and in turn, uh, ground shaking estimates associated with that earthquake at certain locations. Um, based on all of this information. So what we do is we convert the information in the P wave train into estimates about the size of the earthquake using algorithms. So this is a regional earthquake early warning approach. Now we also have an on-site earthquake early warning approach, and this typically consists of just one seismic station located at the target site of interest. So where we want the alert to be disseminated to, and instead of going through a location and a magnitude estimate in this case, we typically go straight to our ground shaking estimate because we don't have as much time in this case when the seismic station is located just close to the target site of interest. So this is an on-site earthquake early warning approach. Now, once we have ground shaking estimates or estimates about the size of the earthquake, the next step involves deciding whether or not to trigger an alarm before the strong shaking, which is carried in the S wave, arrives at the target site of interest. So there's many types of actions we can take once an alarm is triggered. So in the time between when the alarm is triggered and when the strong shaking arrives at the target site of interest. These include uh, ducking, covering and holding, for example, to avoid injuries. We could issue an alarm to slow down trains to avoid derailment, for instance. Um, we can send a signal to um, traffic lights at a bridge preventing 
cars from entering that bridge, for example. And if we have enough time, we could even evacuate a building. Now, there are several uh, earthquake early warning systems currently operating around the world. So there's around nine at the moment, and there's many more countries that are testing this type of system out. So in the US, for example, USGS is um, rolling out the shake alert system in California. Um, I'm working on, on the turnkey project, which is looking at earthquake early warning in Europe. And we have the Japan Meteorological Agency, for example, that's in charge of earthquake early warning in Japan. So the first um, step of the study that we're going to look at in this presentation is calculating earthquake early warning feasibility across Europe. Now for this particular calculation, what we're looking at is we're looking at seismic sources, where the stations are located in relation to those seismic sources and particular target sites of interest. So on the right hand side here, we see a map of the target sites we're interested in measuring earthquake warning, early warning feasibility at. And our earthquake early warning feasibility calculation starts off with understanding where the high hazard area sources are. We then have to determine um, how the P wave and the S waves that would emanate from these area sources travel using velocity models. And finally, we need to understand where seismic stations are located that can start recording the P waves from these earthquakes and um, start the earthquake early warning process in motion. So what we do is we combine the information from all of these three steps and we come up with what is known as a lead time map. So this map shows us the amount of time between when an, an alert would be issued and when strong ground shaking would occur at our target sites. Now we can do this for just one area source, but it's much more interesting if we do it for multiple area sources for a particular target site of interest. So what we do is we calculate the lead time for all area sources that affect our target site of interest. And this results in a lead time distribution. So a collection of lead times for a target site associated with all the different area sources that affect that site. And we can develop based on these probabilistic lead times maps like these. So we have a minimum lead time map, which is the minimum amount of lead time that each of the target sites of interest would have from a particular area source. We also have median lead time and maximum lead time. So the minimum lead time map can be considered sort of the worst case scenario and the maximum lead time map can be considered kind of the best case scenario. So one thing to take away from these particular maps is that we can see from the map on the bottom right, so the best case scenario map, that a lot of our target sites of interest are colored green. And this means that um, a lot of these target sites have greater than or equal to 10 seconds of lead time in this best case scenario. Now, this is a preliminary indication that earthquake early warning could work well uh, across Europe. Now, of course, this is dependent on some underlying assumptions that we've made um, on, say, the size of the events that are occurring at the area sources we looked at, as well as the ground motion threshold, so the ground shaking level at which an alert would be triggered. So the, these all um, kind of feed into the amount of lead time that our target sites have had. But nevertheless, the assumptions that we've made are, are still reasonable. So this is definitely you know, a positive indicator of potential earthquake early warning usefulness across Europe. So rather than just focus on lead times in particular, we can combine this lead time information with other sources of information to get a more informed idea of the potential benefits of earthquake early warning across Europe. So what we do is we take our lead times and we combine it with information on population, 
So where the population is located in relation to those target sites that we focused on in our lead time calculation, and also the average seismic intensities that would occur at our target sites for the area sources we examined and, and some events that occur at those area sources. So by doing this type of calculation, we can determine kind of in a more informative manner, the potential beneficial impact of earthquake early warning. Once we combine all this information together, we can get plots like this. So on the y-axis of these plots, we're showing the percentage of the examined population that's exposed to a particular average seismic intensity from events at the area sources. And on the x-axis, we're showing either the minimum, median, or maximum lead time. Now, the first thing to note is that if you sum up the, um, the y-axis of both of these plots, you see that about 98% of the population are exposed to average seismic intensities between strong and damaging. Um, so this kind of tells us that um, you know, if earthquake early warning works, there is um, a potential for it to have some impact um, on mitigating losses because we can see that you know, losses will be somewhat notable. And a second thing to note is that if we look at the median and the maximum lead time maps in particular, we see that a notable proportion of the population are covered by either a red, yellow, or a green color. And this means that they have positive lead time. So they have some time to take some action. So again, this is a positive indicator of the potential usefulness of earthquake early warning in Europe. Now, what we did in our study is we synthesized all of the information shown on the previous plots into one uh, simple index, uh, which we termed the relative feasibility index. So this has a population component, a lead time component, and a seismic intensity component. And the idea of this index is to measure the feasibility of all target sites relative to each other. And we do this through this percentile measure. So this is the percentile for a particular target site relative to all other target sites. And we only focused on target sites for this index that had a positive median lead time. So the theoretical maximum value that this index could have is one, if a particular site had the largest population surrounding it relative to all our other target sites, it had the, it was exposed to the highest average seismic intensity and it had the highest median lead time. Now, another interesting and convenient feature of this index is our facilitation of weights for each of the different components. And the idea of these weights is to incorporate stakeholder, potential stakeholder preferences towards the different components. So we could imagine that maybe, you know, one stakeholder might be interested in looking at earthquake early warning only for sites that had good lead time. Another stakeholder might be interested in looking at sites that had quite a high exposed population, for instance. And so this weight facilitates these different preferences of stakeholders. Now in the plot that I'm going to show you on the next slide, um, we've assumed that all of these different components of the index are equally weighted. So each of them gets a weight of um, 0.33. Now, it, here is what we have um, if we do this index across all of Europe. And the triangles here are denoting sites with one of the highest um, relative feasibility indices. And what we see uh, and what we can conclude is that Italy, Turkey, and Greece are the countries with the highest relative feasibility across Europe. And all of these countries are associated with some of the, the highest seismic hazard across Europe as well. 
So in conclusion from step one, we saw that almost half of the examined target sites had a lead time of at least 10 seconds in a best case scenario. Now, as I mentioned before, this is dependent on some underlying assumptions associated with the size of the events at the area sources we, we looked at, as well as the threshold at which uh, early warning is issued, as well as delay times in, in an operational earthquake early warning system, because um, you know, earthquake early warning isn't operational yet across Europe, so we have to make some assumptions on how it would work in a practical sense. The next thing um, to note from our study here is that it could be useful as a supplemental risk mitigation tool um, for mitigating the effects of large events on exposed populations. So we saw that when we combined our lead times um, with our population data and our seismic intensity data. Now, again, an interesting or an important thing to note from this conclusion is, is the word supplemental. Um, you know, we know that earthquake early warning won't be able to solve all our risk, risk issues, but it could be used in part to mitigate our risks. And the third conclusion we saw on the previous slide was that earthquake early warning would be most feasible, given our calculations, in Italy, Greece and Turkey. the main part of the presentation, which is this decision-making methodology for risk-informed earthquake early warning. Now, in this case, we're looking in particular at the decision module part of the earthquake early warning system, and we're going to consider regional earthquake early warning systems, although the methodology really is flexible enough to work for an on-site system as well. And the motivation for developing this methodology is that decisions to trigger alarms are typically based on some sort of generic ground motion intensity value or macro seismic intensity value, um, which is fine from, from a seismologist's perspective. Now, the, the thing to note about earthquake early warning is it tends to be developed by seismologists. So that's why they use kind of um, sort of generic one value ground shaking um, to, to calibrate a threshold to trigger an alarm. But the problem is that this does not take into consideration engineering considerations. And as engineers, this is what we are most interested in. And we know that you know, ground shaking isn't always the best indicator of the effects of an incoming earthquake on the built environment. So we want to incorporate that in our methodology. And a second thing that we feel is important is stakeholder preferences and priorities towards different considerations that might be important for the decision-making process. So to address these challenges, our methodology integrates earthquake engineering related procedures for seismic performance assessment. So this um, accounts for the engineering considerations and multi-criteria decision-making tools, which account for stakeholder preferences or priorities. Now, in terms of earthquake engineering related procedures, um, we can think of it in terms of the FEMA P58 methodology, which is a performance-based earthquake engineering procedure for individual building. It's, and it's the particular methodology I use in the application later on. But the idea of performance-based earthquake engineering is we get um, the, a, a sense of the effect of an earthquake or a set of events on the built environment in terms of losses that are interpretable to stakeholders. So losses such as economic loss, casualties, and downtime. And then in terms of multi-criteria decision-making, this involves three sort of requirements on the part of a stakeholder. Now we'll go through these in a bit more detail in the following slides. But the idea is that a stakeholder needs to define the criteria on which they want to base their decision to trigger or not an alarm. They also need to express their preferences towards these different criteria. And finally, they need to provide some values for some of these criteria. And again, we'll go through this in more detail in following slides. But um, multi-criteria decision-making in the context of triggering earthquake early warning related actions in a school could look like this. 
So in this case, a stakeholder might have identified the following criteria. They might want to maximize the safety of students and teachers. They might want to minimize disruption to the school day. And they want to, might want to maximize public satisfaction. Now, the first thing that we do is we take these criteria and we translate them into quantitative metrics. So we can measure maximizing safety by number of casualties. We can measure um, disruption by the number of downtime days. And we could measure public satisfaction by the number of downtime days and also the um, economic cost or the repair cost associated with either taking or not a particular mitigation action. So in this case, it's the importance of these different criteria to a stakeholder and their expected value for a given mitigation action that will determine whether or not that action is taken um, for a particular incoming event. So what we can do is we can take all of these criteria and all of our possible risk mitigation actions and represent them in the form of a consequence matrix like this where each of the columns of the consequence matrix corresponds to particular criteria and each of the rows corresponds to a particular mitigation action. Now there's a lot of information um, on this matrix and we'll go through it uh, slowly in a bit more detail. So firstly, some of the information in the consequence matrix comes directly from the stakeholder, as I mentioned on the first slide. So they need, they need to provide some information to develop this consequence matrix. And the, this information relates to the consequences associated with a false alarm. So this is an important consideration in our consequence matrix because we know that if we trigger alarms unnecessarily and they don't cause you know, any impact on, on the built environment, we'll still incorporate some sort of loss. So in the case of a school, for example, if we trigger an alarm on his, unnecessarily, we might cause you know, half a day's worth of disruption to that school day because people might be panicking and they'll be distract, distracted, et cetera. So we need to consider that type of, of loss when we're deciding whether or not to trigger an alarm. The second type of um, information comes from a mixture of stakeholder input and our seismic performance assessment procedures. And this is information related to mitigation actions. So what is the loss associated with a particular mitigation action? Or in other words, how much of the loss of um, an incoming event is not eliminated by taking a particular mitigation action? So we can think in terms of, for example, um, the action of ducking, covering and holding for an incoming event, um, it may not uh, reduce all of the casualties associated with that incoming event to zero, because for instance, um, somebody still might have an injury and also maybe not everybody had enough time to duck, cover and hold. So we need to consider those types of um, losses in our consequence matrix. And the final type of information comes directly from our performance-based earthquake engineering analysis. And this is information related to the actual earthquake and the case of not taking any particular mitigation action. Because in this case, all we're doing is we're measuring the consequences of that earthquake on the built environment. And we can do that using our conventional risk assessment tools like performance-based earthquake engineering. Once we have this consequence matrix populated, the next step involves incorporating stakeholder preferences towards the different criteria of the matrix. And we do this in the decision matrix. Now, the first part of the process involves normalizing all of the values um, in the consequence matrix. And we do this because the different criteria in the matrix might be measured in different units. And then the next thing is weighting each of the values by the importance that the stakeholder places on that particular criterion. Finally, we take the action that minimizes the collective values of the matrix 
and we take the action that minimizes these values because they're all losses in this case. So let's look at a brief overview of the methodology. So I showed you how we developed a consequence matrix, which was translated into a decision matrix to determine the optimal action. Now, what we need to feed into our consequence matrix is information from our earthquake early warning system on the size of the incoming event. We need to combine that with our performance-based earthquake engineering related assessments to um, populate the consequence matrix. And we also need stakeholder feedback, which goes to complete the consequence matrix as well as the decision matrix. So let's now look at an example application of this methodology for a hypothetical school located in uh, Palo Alto in California. Um, so this was a completely made up school, um, but the thing to know is, I guess it's, it's quite modern, um, the school. And we can develop our consequence matrix for this school like this. Um, now, the thing to note about this consequence matrix is that we only have two actions in this case. So we've simplified the consequence matrix slightly from what I showed you on a previous slide. We either trigger a mitigation action, so we trigger the alarm, or we don't trigger the earthquake early warning alarm in this case. And the entries for the matrix are uh, similar to those I showed on one of the previous slides. So we can go through our decision-making process and ask different questions. The first question we can ask with our methodology is what is the optimal action as a function of ground shaking at our school? So in this case, what we're assuming is that the earthquake early warning system is feeding ground shaking estimates into our consequence matrix. And if that happens, then we can determine the optimal action based on the value. So what we get is a plot like this, where we have our optimal decision on the y-axis as a function of ground shaking at the building on the x-axis. And what we see here um, is the optimal decision expressed as a function of different stakeholder preferences to the underlying criteria. What we can see from the plot, for instance, is that if a stakeholder prioritizes casualties over all other types of criteria, they'll trigger the alarm at a much lower level of ground shaking than they would if they prioritized downtime, for instance. Another question we can ask using this plot is how often is the alarm triggered? And we can answer this question by incorporating hazard information uh, on the site into our calculation. So what we can conclude from this plot is that the optimal action will depend on stakeholder preferences. So this is an interesting finding and it underlines um, the importance of incorporating stakeholder preferences in deciding whether or not to trigger a mitigation action for earthquake early warning. And another uh, observation from this plot is that an alarm will be triggered about once every 10 years if, if casualties are prioritized. Another question we can ask is, what is the optimal action as a function of magnitude and distance? So in this case, um, we can think of the earthquake early warning system as feeding in magnitude and location estimates to our consequence matrix. And we can come up with plots like these. So here we have our optimal decision as a function of magnitude for different distances away from the particular event. Now, as we see, um, as we get further and further away from the event, uh, the lowest magnitude at which an alarm would be triggered gets higher and higher, um, as we expect. And again, we see that the optimal decision for a given um, distance and a given magnitude may depend on stakeholder preferences. Again, underlining the importance of considering these in our calculation. A final question we can ask is, what is the optimal action as a function of earthquake early warning parameters? And by this, I mean 
sort of the raw parameters that are used from the P waveform to the, and then get translated into estimates of magnitude, location, and ground shaking. So what we can do is we can assume that these are being fed directly into our consequence matrix. And this is kind of the most uh, sort of realistic way of looking at our system, because in reality, we won't have certain estimates of magnitude and location and ground shaking coming from our earthquake early warning system. We'll have raw parameters which will be associated with uncertainty on the underlying magnitude, location and ground shaking associated with them. So for this particular question, let's assume that we have a scenario earthquake that's occurring um, southeast of where our site is. And what we're showing on this figure here is um, all of the seismic stations that surround the earthquake. And the solid triangles denote stations that have already triggered. So this is where the P wave has already arrived at these stations. And we can use this information to determine estimates about the size of the incoming event and from there determine the optimal action to take. So as we evolve in time, more and more stations will be triggered. So here we have four stations triggered, first of all, then 13, 29, and 81. Um, and for each of these different scenarios, we can extract our earthquake early warning parameters from um, our, our P waves, which are recorded at each of the stations. And we can determine estimates of the magnitude, so probability distributions of the magnitude as a function of the earthquake early warning parameters that we recorded. Now, it's important to note uh, one assumption that we've made in this calculation is that the location of the earthquake is known. Um, and that's quite a reasonable assumption because it tends to be known quite early in the process. But the magnitude is a different story that takes a while to be constrained to its true value. Um, now, in this case, what we can do is we can take our distribution of magnitude. And we've seen from a previous slide how um, we can determine the optimal action as a function of magnitude. And what we really need to do is we need to kind of weight the probability of, a mag of the underlying event being a particular magnitude um, with its optimal decision to predict the optimal decision for the incoming event. So we can do this for various different magnitudes. Um, and what we see from this plot here is the proportion of correct decisions that we make. So the proportion of times that we choose the correct optimal decision to take as a function of triggered stations for different magnitudes. Now, what we can see um, especially in the case of the magnitude 5.5 event, is as more stations are triggered, um, our accuracy in uh, predicting the optimal action increases as we might expect, because if we look back at this plot, we're constraining ourselves closer and closer to the true magnitude as more and more stations are triggered because we're recording more and more data about the incoming event. But of course, that comes at the cost then of having to wait for more and more stations to trigger and therefore um, decreasing the amount of lead time we have at our site. Another thing to note is that the accuracy of um, our optimal decision prediction changes as a function of magnitude. So we can see for a 5.5 magnitude, the accuracy is less than it is for the magnitude 6.9. And this is because if we look at uh, this plot, for instance, um, magnitude 5.5 is around where the optimal decision kind of fluctuates between not triggering the alarm and triggering the alarm for the given distance that we're examining. And um, so sometimes we'll be predicting a lower magnitude, sometimes we'll be predicting a higher magnitude, and therefore our optimal decision prediction will be a bit um, inaccurate sometimes. Whereas if we look at the 6.9 event, all magnitudes around that event are predicting that the optimal action is to take, is to, is to take an action, is, is to trigger the alarm. So in that case, we tend to be um, quite accurate with their decision early on in the process. So in, in conclusion, 
um, we can see that the optimal action prediction becomes more accurate as more stations are triggered, as we would expect. Um, and another thing to note about this calculation is that we can do all of these calculations offline um, before the event happens, and then just consult a sort of lookup table of the relationship between the earthquake early warning parameters that are being measured um, at the seismometers and the optimal action to determine the optimal action. So this increases the efficiency of our real-time decision-making process. So in conclusion, um, we developed this decision-making methodology for risk-informed earthquake early warning that combines seismic performance assessment procedures to consider engineering considerations and multi-criteria decision-making tools to account for stakeholder preferences in the decision-making process. I showed how um, we can apply this decision-making methodology to a hypothetical school. And for the school, we found that the optimal decision is a function of stakeholder preferences towards the underlying criteria, underlying the importance of considering this in our process. And of course, it varies as a function of ground shaking and magnitude as well. And we saw that we could determine the optimal action for given earthquake early warning parameters um, offline before an actual earthquake occurs. And then we can consult that um, sort of database we've created in real time for very efficient decision making. Um, so here's some uh, references uh, from step one and step two that I showed, um, as well as some additional uh, reading that you might be interested in. Um, thank you for your attention and um, I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you very much. Very interesting, specifically that bit that you were comparing the distances and magnitudes and how the alarm was getting triggered. Uh, as always, uh, anyone, if you have any question, please raise your hand and uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, I can read the, the questions in the chat as well, in case we don't have a microphone. Uh, I'll have a question regarding uh, the false alarms. Like a month ago, uh, there was a false alarm in Chile, if I'm not wrong. It was because of a tsunami alert, but it was triggered by an earthquake. and. Um, the whole country went into like leave the beach and uh, leave the coast. Have you asked those stakeholders what will happen and what is their reaction about the false alarms as well? Will they be acceptance with that or will they be frustrated? Yes. Or should they will be frustrated? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, so yeah, you, there's kind of two kind of schools of thought, I think, about false alarms. Um, in general, they're seen as kind of a welcome um, uh, opportunity to do um, sort of like an earthquake or an earthquake drill, um, particularly in a school setting. Um, and I suppose like on the other end of the scale, you know, in, in an industrial setting where you where you, you want your business to continue and um, that that kind of false alarm is not particularly welcome so it depends on on the context and um, we, we that's kind of um one of uh Carmine's phd students omar and um, he did a, a big review on that and he found that in general they were welcome um, and at the moment we're actually asking stakeholders in japan um what their attitude is is to false alarm so it, it varies and um, but of course you know you don't want false alarms happening every day yeah, I can un understand in a school is actually a good thing. They will practice, but in a society and in a city, people's trust will drop to zoop. Uh, Damien, I can see that you have raised your hand, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Cool. Th uh, thanks for the talk, Gemma. Um, this is Damien Grant from Arup. Um, well, I've actually got sort of a, a query about um, early warning from a, a client recently, so I'm, I'm kind of a bit um, self-motivated in asking this question, but it's also kind of interesting. Um, how, I'm just, just kind of wondering how typically when these have been implemented by countries, you know, for example, the, the Japanese one you mentioned, um, how sort of publicly available is the information from these systems? Are they, are they set up, um, such that the public can tap into them with, with, um, you know, with receiving mobile phone alerts or are they set up such that companies can, can register to, to receive the warnings or 
is it more for public systems like the bullet train, for example, in Japan? Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Damien, for your question. Um, so it, it's actually kind of a mixture of two. Um, so as far as I know, there is um, certain, uh, so it, in general, they tend to be like a public system. Um, you, you might get like information about the amount of time you have um, to uh, take an action, for instance, and you normally have some sort of estimate of, of the incoming shaking. Um, as far as I know, in the US, there is definitely... Um, I don't think they've done it yet, but there's definitely an interest in, in companies having these systems installed in their, in their buildings. Um, but in general, they tend to be a public system. And yeah, they have like a smartphone application, for example, in, in the Shake Alert system in, uh, in California. Okay, because obviously on the sort of five to 10 second or, or 10 second plus kind of range, you know, sort of having automated systems tapped into that rather than relying on a on a facility manager checking his or her mobile phone alert and implementing something, you know, that's that's quite a different yeah. order of magnitude. So I, I, I'm kind of, I, I'm not sure if you know the answer and maybe um, just kind of curious if there's, you know, almost like a fee that a company could could pay to tap into these systems, if that's a model that anyone, like yeah. so such that your automatic systems tie into the, um, the public system. Yeah, so I definitely know, um, that there is interest in doing that in California. I'm not sure if okay. um, they've implemented it yet, but I've seen some reports on on, uh, on that being a thing. Cool, thank you. Actually, sorry, if I, uh, one other question I had. Um, uh, was I right in saying that the sort of feasibility study for Europe um, that you showed um, relied on the sort of existing accelerometer network? Yes. And I was just yeah. wondering how, how sensitive that is. I mean, you may have thought that Fees of, you know, if, if one were to implement a big system like that in Europe uh, or in parts of Europe, that um, part of that would also be to roll out um, new accelerometer networks, potentially sort of targeting particular areas. Yeah, yeah. So that's like, that's exactly the, um, the, the, the goal of, of the, the turnkey project that we're working on oh, is, to, is to roll out accelerometers. And yeah, you're right. I mean, um, it's very dependent on um, where the accelerometers are now, our uh, particular mm. study. Um, and, you know, it, as well as that, we need to assume then that the those accelerometers are kind of optimized for quick release, which may not be the case. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of an in, initial study. Um, but definitely, you know, it would be more, even more informative if you knew um, that more, more accelerometers were going to be coming online soon. And, True, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for that. You're welcome. Uh, I can see people raising their hands. Uh, I'll go through you one by one. Just one curiosity. Uh, during the recent AGNC earthquake, the Izmir earthquake, uh, did the alert of the Izmir go on or do you have any data of that? Um, I actually don't know um, about that one. Um, can be I'm a good sure. case study. Yeah. We, uh, we have a we have a fork from Turkey. I don't know if it's online, but maybe maybe tell if that went online. Um, I don't know if you're there. If you have any comments, you're all here. Yeah. Can I add something on on Daniel's question? Um, I, Damian, thanks for for your question. I mean, to to add on that, I think there are companies, for instance, Bart in in San Francisco Bay Area in California. They are partnering with the USGS type of system, and so they have a ad hoc type of uh, agreement for which you know they they receive direct information for their business essentially stopping the trains. Um, in, in some other cases, in Mexico. Uh, and Omar may, may want to jump in, but same, I mean, there are both like public that goes in television and, and radio uh, and like, uh, but also there are like private companies that can have uh, more specific infrastructure specific type of application. So I think in this uh, reference five that you see here uh, with, with Omar, we try to investigate all those issues in Mexico, California, Italy and Japan. Uh, so it's really depend on case by case and infrastructure by infrastructure. Okay, thanks. 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 Okay. Uh, Karim, if you want to ask your question, please. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Gemma, for the great work and the great presentation. Maybe I didn't get this quite right, but uh, is there any, have you considered the uncertainty giving magnitude for the ground shaking? Because you can have a ground shaking from magnitude six 
that looks like a ground motion from magnitude five, for example. So I'm just yeah. curious to, to see if whether the, the uncertainty in the P wave arrival is considered regarding a given magnitude. Um, yeah, so uh, it's essentially, um, we, we consider the uncertainties drive the whole process. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like it's in it's a series of integrals of, of uh, probability distribution. So we have uh, our uncertainty on magnitude, and then we have our uncertainty on IM given magnitude as well. So yeah, we do consider it. Okay, so but uh, can we have this, I mean, in my head, I was running the exercise of doing this approach, implementing your approach for the known faults we have mm -hmm. versus the background seismicity model that we have. So, and how different could be in terms of, because the known faults will potentially produce large magnitude events, which will trigger large stations. However, the, the background seismicity implies that anywhere you can have a magnitude four or five and so on. So I'm just trying to understand for myself, what will be the implication on the decision matrix? If we do this exercise separately, once for known faults with large magnitudes, larger than six, for example, and other background seismicity sources, do you have any comments or any thoughts I would appreciate? So, so you mean, um given the difference in, in magnitude between background seismicity and faults? No, the idea of, well, in terms of source rupture occurrence, you can consider that background seismicity events can occur under your structure yeah. or anywhere, yeah, yeah, as mean. opposed to faults. Yeah. So I'm trying to de dissect the problem of early warning for the known faults and with large magnitude events and early warning for any event that could happen anywhere, basically. Yeah, so, um, it, so yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, in, in, our, in our feasibility study, um, we considered like a area source, a uniform distribution of area sources. Um, but in general, um, what tends to happen is uh, earthquake early warning systems get set up for um, known faults. So, you know, we, um, we tend to uh, put our seismic stations located close to where we assume the uh, epicenter rupture is going to occur. Um, now, of course, um, on, the, on the other side as well, um, uh, we can have this on-site system, which uh, you know will will uh, alert our, our structure regardless of where the earthquake occurs. But of course, you know we do have that situation where if if the earthquake occurs underneath the building, then we have no no time. But there's there's always um, a kind of a radius around by which um, uh, by which once we have the alert, we won't have any time to take any action. So we, we always have to you know, account for the fact that earthquake early warning won't, have, won't be effective in every single situation, if that makes yeah. sense. But I, I love the fact that you made it very structure specific. And then I, 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 it's very great work. It's also, it's would be in, on the rupture forecast side, it's not as a specific, I guess, if you want to go and implement this for a given country or region, you can implement the same methodology specifically to that region. And when doing that, you can do this for the known faults, for the background sources and so on, and try to see the differences there. Yeah. yeah. Can I have a small thing here? Let me be a very Italian professor at that thing. If you go to the previous slide uh, where you have the magnet distributing one, the previous uh, one before, yeah. So Karim, the way it works, you have a um, isolation framework. So you have a prior information, which typically is either the Gutenberg Richter for the zone, if you have area source, or if it's a fault, you can have, for instance, you know, characteristic or hybrid type of model. And then you update that information with the stations that have been triggered. So there are empirical models that correlate the predominant period of MP waves to the final magnitude, some uncertainty. So you do account for uncertainty through all the process, uh, through this scaling relationship between magnitude and, and peak wave parameters, including uncertainty, but also then you constrain to the variation approach 
to the prior, which again can be the, the Gutenberg Richter if you are considering area source, or can be a, any type of uh, recurrence model for a, for a given fault. So it mm -hmm. is accounted for uh, in a very specific, in very detailed way. Uh, but then you know you want something at the end which is practical. That's why we are plotting the results in terms of IM or, or magnitude and distance or the um, uh, PD whatever parameters that we are using. But that optimal decision comes from all the you know p integral where you have all the uncertainty from uh, through FEMA p58 in this particular case. Um, I hope that clarify a bit. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of ground motion, it clarifies. I'm just it's, it was a curious curiosity for me to mm -hmm. see whether the events from large magnitude, uh, sorry, ground motion from large magnitude events from known faults will end up in a will give us different decision parameter as opposed to the background. Well, really, yeah, really depends on how many stations you are considering in the process. Uh, mm -hmm. So, of course, more time, this information, if you see this, this plot that John is showing, so this is a simulation for a Magnum 6 event. Uh, and, you know, when you have uh, 13 to 29 stations, which means, however, to have a reduction lead time of 10, 15 seconds for this particular area, you are converging. The model value of your distribution is very close to your uh, uh, true value, which is 6. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's the way it works. So now the challenge, you know, how many stations you want, you need to consider for making the optimal decision is a trade-off between, uh, you know, lead time and number of stations that results in a more accurate information. So that, that that's a challenge. Um, anyway, yeah. I don't want to take the time for other questions so we can talk offline about that if you want. Thanks, thanks both for the thanks. comments and the insights. Thanks for the presentation as well. Okay, I can see Wilson raising your hand. Just one quick question before Wilson unmutes and ask his question. Uh, are you looking only at critical infrastructure, like schools, or like you move on to hospitals and uh, fire stations and stuff like that as well? Um, well, yeah, so, so the, the underlying methodology could work for any critical infrastructure, um, but in our particular project, um, we're looking, so we extended this methodology and to a port, um, considering all of the uh, interdependencies between the functionality of, of a port system. And we also um, are looking at applying it to a bridge uh, in the Pyrenees. Um, but yeah, theoretically, it could be applied to any critical infrastructure. Okay. Uh, Wilson, if you still have a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kerman, for such valuable insight about the early warning system. I have a question about like the preference of the stakeholder. As you mentioned uh, in your slide, uh, generally when they try to minimize the number of casualties, they will give more importance to, they will treat the alarm like uh, even for uh, small intensities. But if this can be feasible to the three countries I mentioned in Europe, Italy, Turkey, and Greece, which have like different, um, perspective, maybe different uh, founding or ways of dealing with these situations. So in that case, uh, it will be more practical to conduct like this type of analysis for different preferences according to the preference of the stakeholder of, a, um, of each country, or you will look for like a way to come up with an agreement so that you can conduct like just one analysis using like an integration of the preferences from the stakeholder of these countries. Yeah, so, so that, that's a good question. Um, so I, I suppose our idea is to, is, to, is to develop it for like a series of different stakeholder preferences. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we, you can do this um, like thing for, for any um, particular uh, combination of stakeholder preferences towards the underlying criteria, but then yeah, so the, I, I guess this this type of methodology facilitates um, stakeholder input in a way that um, you know you you can you can take this methodology and you know then kind of like what questions to ask a stakeholder in order to determine their importance. Um, so yeah, so in in I guess in in the most accurate uh, sense of of applying this methodology, what you should do. Is you should um, is you should go and consult the stakeholders in the particular um, context in which this will be applied to determine the correct weighting for each of the criteria. 
Um, but we've developed it as a general methodology that would work for any of the any of the different uh, criteria. So somebody could just you know take this methodology and apply it for any particular combination, um, if that makes sense. And then in in our feasibility study, um, we didn't actually consider uh, this decision making methodology. So it was just um, more a case of uh, determining how much time. Um, uh, a particular target site would have in a very simplistic way so it was just like if four stations are triggered how much time they would have between um that happening and the s wave occurring at their site for a particular ground motion threshold so it was it was very simplistic because we were doing it across across europe but of course yes uh, this shows that you know that's not the best way of of dealing with earthquake early warning in a very specific context Okay, thank you very much for your clarification. You're welcome. Uh, I can see Tawhid raising his hand. Very good to have you here. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Yes, I'm an outsider to uh, to this community, but uh, yeah, uh, but I'm I'm doing optimization and decision making. That's the reason I was interested in in your work. And uh, thanks so much for that. But um, I had one question, which is general. In the in the uh, decision making under uncertainty, uh, like uh, ground, uh, when we consider the uncertainty, sometimes it is important. I mean, depending on application, sometimes it's important for us to have the uncertainty probability distribution, which maybe in your case having loads of different sources finding that using, I don't know, Bayesian bootstrap or even empirical method to find those uh, distribution, that can be a challenge. But how important it is in your field to know that distribution can, can if, if you are given just some bounds of your uncertainty, would that be enough for you? Because from the methodologically, from the optimization under uncertainty, having just some bounds around your uncertainty, minimum and maximum, let's say, that would be uh, enough to make decision. So for you, how much important is that probability distribution? Um, so you mean um, like the, the, the Bayesian prior or the whole, um, the whole uncertainty? The whole uncertainty and and later on because you use those uh, i guess the bayesian or maybe some boost strapping or even empirical method to figure out for example these slides that you are showing now here with different parameters you are coming with some probability density function uh how much it is important for you that you know that uh your scenarios let's say uh are coming from this distribution like with this like mean or I don't know, is it log normal or is normal or I don't know, variable distribution, all, all these sorts of things. I mean, how important it is that you know the underlying distribution? I see. Um, so I think that depends on, um, thank, firstly, thanks for your question. I've never thought about it in this way before, but um, that, that really depends on the underlying um, uh, uh, size of the event. Um, so uh, I think you know if if the if the magnitude distribute if, if the if the incoming event is is quite large then um, knowing the exact um, on the, the 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 optimal decision will be kind of better constrained um, just because uh, a lot of you know for a large event we know that we're going to trigger the alarm straight away. Um, Whereas for um, smaller events, um, it, 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 the, the underlying distribution is, I, I think is, is, is quite important because that, that's where um, we, we kind of fluctuate between different decisions. Um, so mm. it really depends on, on, on the situation, on the size of the, mm. of the incoming event. Mm. So, but if, if, you are, if you are given a chance or if you, if you are told that uh, you can uh, have a trigger base, let's say, solution that if this thing happened, then do this, let's say, and you can fit this thing into your uh, optimization without going through all those burdens of, let's say, 
uh, empirically making your uh, probability density function, would that be any use in your in your field? Um, yes, yes. So yeah, so I think I think it, it would in the sense that um, what I kind of show on on this slide is that is is that's kind of like what you're you're doing in a sense because what you're you're saying is you're you're just basing your your threshold on um, some earthquake early warning parameters that are that are incoming. Yes, um, and then yeah, and then your 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 and it is regardless of the shape of your probability density function that I think is a, is a huge burden in and actually it would be a lot of sensitivity of your result of the your optimal solution would depend on this empirically. Uh, evaluated uh, or drive probability density function. So if you had like something like deeply uncertain probability density function where all those points uh, could be uh, like equally likely, mm -hmm. would that make any sense in the earthquake like trigger base like solution? Um, no, I don't think that would make sense um, because uh, in that case you would end up with um, kind of something between uh, taking and not taking the action which would um, yeah it, it def I think you know having the underlying um, distribution uh, is, is quite important mm -hmm. in this case, um, mm -hmm. especially the relationship between the earthquake early warning parameters and the magnitude. Um, because you know, if you get that, if you get that wrong, or if you kind of assume the wrong uh, relationship or, or mm -hmm. an inaccurate relationship, you'll, you'll get a, a wrong decision. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. Again, we're well over the, the clock. Uh, thank you, Gemma. Uh, I'll just share my screen for a second. Uh, two, yeah, so uh, today we had Dr. Gemma Kremen. Thank you again for such an interesting view on one side of er uh, earthquake early warning. Uh, it's, uh, it's March, so we have back-to-back -back epicenter seminars. Uh, next one will be uh, on moving beyond safety and fragility toward equitable seismic risk management by Felipe Rivera, which will be next week on 10th of March. Um, and then we'll continue with other events all the way to the end of March. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to know of all the events which are coming. Uh, the recording of our events will be available on our uh, YouTube channel as well. So thank you very much for everyone who joined us. Thank you very much to Gemma as well. As always, very thank interesting. You. And we'll see you next week. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. See you, everyone. Oh, Matt is here. Yes, see you later. for you guys. <laughs> good, good. Thanks so much. See you later. I'll close this session now.